Please welcome Alan Tiggerson. Good morning. You've heard our vision for the future and our product team just laid out the roadmap to get us there. And that's a map to what's next and we're very excited to build that future with you. But I'm here to talk about what works now. So you've been building the marketing organizations of tomorrow since before the pandemic. And the last few years have been a roller coaster, thinking in quarter to quarter or even week to week increments. Now we want to help set you up to be ready for years to come. Uh, the pandemic likely broke some organizational inertia, but the challenge now is keeping that spirit of accelerated learning and agility going. This is about continuing the digital transformation process, not starting over. Now, if we learned anything from the last two years, it's that being ready is not a feeling, it's a choice. Because the most digitally mature marketers who were ready are reporting big gains. The leaders reported a five percentage point increase in market share during the pandemic versus their peers. And we see a few common themes among those leading brands. The brands that are ready created marketing, agile, and responsive enough to capture short-term opportunities while building long-term resilience. Like The Ordinary, the skincare line made by the abnormal beauty company Decium, they were ready for the COVID-driven direct-to-consumer and self-care trends. But they began as a scrappy Canadian startup looking for a global audience in the crowded beauty space. They broke through by breaking down their marketing in a few simple steps. First, they set clear objectives, which for their business focused on brand awareness and customer loyalty. Then the ordinary studied regional search trends to identify the top markets where they could turn searches into sales using Google Shopping campaigns. Then they finally, they used our automated tools seeded with data from those pilots to scale globally. And the results have been a five to one return on their ad spend. Now, the brands that are ready also adopt a test and learn mindset. And they saw a 3x return on their digital initiatives versus those less digitally mature. Let's look at Monday.com, which is the work operating system. Their product evolution has been supported by marketing to match in terms of agility and growth. They just scaled globally, they IPO'd last year, and they used a data-driven approach to test and optimize messages on platforms like YouTube. And as a B2B player, they've adapted their messaging for different audiences. When they were first trying to connect with marketing and creative teams, they realized they could better optimize their messaging. So they pivoted, and in less than a week, they were testing new campaigns, showcasing the benefits for marketers, driving a 25% increase in qualified signups. They've incorporated an always-on testing mindset in their planning and budgets, dedicating 30% of their spending to experiments to identify new audiences, new creative, and new bidding strategies. And finally, brands that are ready overcome organizational silos to make digital transformation a company-wide initiative. Let's look at Kia. So Kia has gone through a brand relaunch to become a more customer-centric mobile solution provider. Like many automakers, Kia used to see dealers as their customers, and they had limited interactions with the drivers who ultimately buy their cars. But they recognized that potential drivers searching online wanted an integrated experience when they walked into the showroom and hopefully drove off the lot. So they did something new. They started working with regional dealers to build standardized web templates and data policies to provide a consistent customer experience and give Kia a better picture of their end users. And as they built their first party data strategy, Kia is focused on providing a real value exchange to their customers who love tricking out their ride in Kia's car customization tool and appreciate the ease of booking a test drive online. So in one test, Kia connected their website with the dealer's CRM and they saw a 4x boost in conversion rates on their marketing. Now, those are just a few examples. 
but you don't have to take my word for it. Digital transformation is happening across every industry, but media and entertainment has perhaps been on this journey longer than most. So I'm honored to have here Sarah Harden, who is the CEO of Hello Sunshine, the media brand anchored in storytelling with a mission to change the narrative for women. With the co-founder, Reese Witherspoon, Hello Sunshine produces shows like Big Little Lies, The Morning Show, films like Gone Girl and Wild, but they also do unscripted series, animation, podcasts, and the popular Reese's Book Club. And they have found success across every major streaming platform, including HBO, Netflix, Apple, Hulu, and more. Please welcome Sarah Harden. Hello. Uh, so great to see you. You too, and I love the yellow chair. It's very on brand for Hello Sunshine. Thank well, you. Well, there you go. I don't know that we thought of that, but uh, I'll take it. <laughs> so what an incredible journey you've been on for the last couple of years. Can you talk a little about what attracted you to this work and specifically Sunshine's mission to, uh, to change the narrative for women? You know, like a lot of good companies, when, when Reese founded the company and we came together to talk about the company we wanted to build, it was born of frustration. And, and I think frustration at the status quo and what we saw in media and the equal side of that was the opportunity. And I think what we saw was audiences that were over-indexing on social, um, that were consuming content, um, women, people of colour, otherized voices that had been structurally excluded from storytelling for decades. And as a result of that, people weren't seeing the full range of their lived experiences in their media. And that just seemed like a wide open space and a gap. I think the other thing we saw, and you know, Reese has decades as an actress, as a pro producer, and I had been building direct to consumer media um, brands as well, was that the business has been very siloed, right? You, you'd, had, you'd had these film and TV production companies and you'd had social storytelling and digital companies, often sort of off to the left. Um, <laughs> And this was an integrated world. The content was launching into a cultural conversation. And uh, we thought there's an opportunity to build an integrated media company that, that not only made premium storytelling, that better reflected the audiences that everyone's looking to connect with, um, but then take responsibility as a company for helping audiences show up to that yeah. media, whether that's a YouTube series, whether that's a streaming film, whether it's a podcast. Well, and I think, there's so many analogies for all the marketers in the room. Yeah. Integrated, an integrated approach to the market is not just for media companies, it's yeah. for everyone who's trying to reach an audience. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, look, the fight for attention is very real. I think we all, um, you know, we all live that. And I think it's the bars just getting higher and higher and higher. So, I mean, it's something we spend a lot of time <laughs> thinking about every day, especially in a post-pandemic world, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, so I, I mentioned in my intro that uh, uh, you've been incredibly successful across literally every major streaming mm -hmm. service. Can you talk a little about that consumer move and what are the most recent changes you're seeing and that you think your people should keep an eye on? Well, I think, you know, if I come back to the fight for attention, right, mm -hmm. I think the quality of attention, and I, I think one of the things we talk about and we see is that, you know, obviously people are consuming more content than, yeah. than ever before, but but, the intentional viewer, I think, is very thoughtful about how they're spending their time. And so we think a lot about that viewer. And, uh, and somewhat paradoxically, they're also everywhere, yeah. right, on every platform. So how do you show up to the intentional viewer across all platforms in a way that feels consistent to your brand, that um, meets that expectations, but whether that's in a six second short or in a, a feature film, um, that there's a consistency to that. And um, so I, I think that's one thing we see. I think, you know, we always talk about the right story at the right time. Um, I, I think there's something else that's happening today, which is you have to do that. And that means on the right platform and in the right format. Um, it's one of the reasons we built to be able to tell stories, whether in short form, in audio, yeah. or, in, or in feature film. But I think the other thing we really have to think about for a consumer right now is, why right now? What's the urgency for me to look at this right now? 
And that means understanding, we talked about that cultural conversation, understanding where people are in their lives. Like, where women are in May is very different than where they are in July. I mean, May's, am I right? May is the worst month of the year for parents. Dads as well, but we do a lot of our social listening for women. It's horrific. So, for someone to be seen, like who you are, the opportunity to connect to someone and say, I know where you are in your life right now. You're trying to make 27 school events, and it's a big, May is a big, you know, month for working for work as well. And so I think we, we think a lot about um, the intentional viewer, the right story, the right time, the right platform. And, and that means we have built independently, right. right? Because we mean that. We try and find the right dream team, the right partners um, to stack the decks on how we author our content to give it the, the best chance of making a bid for connection with a viewer. Well, I think, again, to make an analogy, marking you, you, you think about how to connect your viewers across the funnel, and you right. have a variety of platforms, and that then gives you the opportunity and the permission, and of course the, the data, to, uh, to find them at the right time. Look, it's true, and I think that was one of the things you see, everything you do is launching into an existing cultural conversation, and if, if you're lucky and you have the intention to it, you can add to that conversation, you can start new ones, you can extend it, but if you're not, um, in that conversation right from the start. First, you're missing a big opportunity, you know, whatever that thing that used to be old-fashioned called word of mouth. <laughs> um, but you will also be shaped by that conversation too. And, and I think we, I think about in this fight for attention, I think the other thing is, you know, I believe that fortune favours the distinctive right. and the brave. You will be rewarded for it if you get it right. And if it's authentically stacked to who you are as a brand. Like, yeah. it, that's coming through very clearly, that you, you understand your why and what are we doing that's additive to someone's life? Because that's their bar, right? I think I we all see that. Totally agree, and it, it's not about whiz-bang effects, it's about authenticity and yeah. storytelling and you exemplify yeah. that. Uh, talk to us a little about your process for greenlighting a project. How do you decide what to back and launch? You know, we built the company with a lot of intention. We have a convening mission about putting women at the center of the story um, and at all of our narratives. And so that provides a very clear filter for us, which is helpful. We then, we spend a lot of time focusing on authentic authorship. And that means the stories we choose to tell, who's in our writer's rooms, who's on our crews. And you know, that there's a driving belief that we have that intentional authorship will be seen and felt by the intentional viewer. And, and that really, so, so that's where we start. Um, and then we try and set things up in the marketplace. Uh, and again, that is right platform, right story, right time. And, um, and so that's one of the reasons we work independently. And it's, um, it's also, you know, some stories, it's, it was one of Reese's first um, things we talked about. She said, I want to be able to sit with a creator and hear a story and whether that is best told as a podcast, a TV series, a short form series, uh, a social campaign, a documentary. We have to have the, the, the mission control in our company right. to bring that to life. And so we've already thought about that then and then it's going and finding the dream partners to put together. And, you know, it's, it's, we're working with brands like this too, and I think sometimes we talk about, you know, we have five years of brand equity. Reese has obviously right. decades of brand equity. We work with partners who have decades of brand equity. What are the things that only we can uniquely do as partners? And we really spend a lot of time finding, stacking the deck on authorship is what we, right. what we call it, yeah. It, it's, it is striking. I think you think about the number of perceived rules that you broke right, at the time when you got started everyone thought that you needed to be a vertically integrated company with a streaming service and then studios to produce content for that service. And you said, no, no, we're gonna be an independent producer. Everyone thought you could be a single media format. No, no, we're gonna be across all media. Yeah. And so uh, I think there's some lessons there, I think for marketers in the room that you gotta think holistically about distribution everywhere. The fact that you are unaffiliated and are able to pick the, the best path to market for each of your products is, and I think an incredible strength of the company. Yeah, I mean, I think, I always talk about we were really lucky to be able to start with a clean sheet of paper, but, but not really, because we had Reese and um, her influence and everything yeah. she brought, uh, you know, as her history and already working as a premium producer too, but we didn't have legacy. And so I, I, we really looked and said, how do we build a company that's arch architected for the next five to 10 years of media and not the one just that we just left? And so in the early, the last five years, we I feel like we've been slightly ahead of the curve, but we're continually having to reconceptualize what that means, right? And 
how are we innovating the connection between, and this is where digital is so good, you, you know, innovating the connection between, between content, um, whether it's on a streaming platform or on a, you know, on a, a digitally native platform or, uh, or wherever that is and connect that with community and, and, and other engagement experience, whether that's commerce or live events or, or asking people to take action as a result of that content. So I, you have such a forward-looking perspective on the entertainment mm -hmm. business and all the marketers here you know, need to understand how can you reach the consumer over the next five to 10 years? What are some of the trends for entertainment that you think are particularly important for marketers to understand? Well, there's a couple I'm paying a lot of attention to now. I mean, it's interesting, and, and look, we feel this. Reese is the best person at this, right? We, we have a worthy mission that we live and breathe. We have really strong brand values, and I know like all of you do in this room, I think sometimes we can fall victim to like thinking about our storytelling with all this meaning and earnestness, and, and we certainly, um, and, and I don't want to dismiss that, but when you really look I think in a post-pandemic world too, or in a living with the pandemic forever world, I don't know which world we're in, but um, the, the importance and, and not forgetting the importance of joy, bringing joy to people's lives. We are over-indexed on meaning and under-indexed on joy and simplicity. You know, the power of curation. We, you know, Reese's Book Club, it, books sit at the center of our advantage. Um, and Reese picks a book every month. It's a huge utility to a consumer to say, in a sea of everything to read, here's one thing that's worthy of your time and attention, that book. And then we option a lot of those books and turn them into film and TV shows. So the power of curative voices. And so I think the paradox of choice is something we all live with. I, do, I don't think, and I say this every few years, but I really believe it now, I don't think there's ever been a better time when you look ahead the next five years for brands. When you look at where we've come with the dual, the media model of subscription and ads, right, in a cable world. It used to be the programming was additive and the ads were interruptive, right, right. and disruptive. You look at a digital model in a streaming world and, and, and the marketplace is, it's with, with the latest decision by Netflix, this is the model. And the competitive frontier is how do we connect with more additive, um, purposeful marketing content experiences that are much more integrated. And you can do that on digital in a That's way right. that you couldn't do on the, in the traditional cable model. So I think two big opportunities. Brands as long form, you, you, you are and can be the entertainers. You know, we are working with brands to create these, what we call these cultural storytelling franchises. It's a small part of the media mix, but it's a, it's a new type of bid con for connection with an audience on platforms where you've, you know, you've, in, in traditionally you were only there in a disruptive way, right? And I think there's so much happening here. There's so much innovation um, to go around that. And I think it's a huge opportunity. And I also think brands as curatorial voices, yes. helping consumers find their way in, in the brand equity of the emotional real estate your brand has with a consumer. It's a huge service to help simplify their lives, simplify their choices in ways that you signal, I understand you, right. you get me. You know where I am in my life. And um, I mean, it's difficult. Like some of our programming, we're planning two years out and three years out in, in the case of film. And, but, but others, and I think that's why we're experimenting and testing and learning on a lot of our um, digital storytelling formats too, to really signal to people, I, I know where you are, right place, right time, with purposeful marketing additive to their lives. And I, I think it's, I'm very excited about um, about the next two or three years, because I think the innovation around um, around storytelling across longer and longer formats is only just, it's just starting to happen in quality ways. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I, I think associating yourself with authentic storytelling, whether it's a YouTube creator yep. or the, the very high quality storytelling from, um, from Hello Sunshine, I think that's the future. I think that's where brand loyalty we built. Yeah. I agree 100% with you. Mm. Well, Sarah, thank you so much thank for coming. So much for thank me. you for having me. Thank you for a lot. It, it was uh, a thrill. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Alan. Thank All you. Right.